that done. Testing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, it is uh, great to be here. Uh, I have uh, been, had the pleasure of being in Kern County plenty of times, uh, but the first time working with Richard and the Kern County ADC, so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I am kind of, to set things off today, trying to give you some sense of <coughs> what's going on out there in the world. Uh, I, by the way, I should point out something. Roadrunners, go Roadrunners. Bulls as well. Um, by the way, Buffalo and Bakersfield both had um, the privilege of being in the NCAA tournament this year. And both teams had the privilege of getting wiped out in the first round. That's okay. <laughs> we were there. That's the important thing. So, um, on to more important things. What is going on in the world? Now, if you have not been paying attention, let me kind of go through the litany. Uh, market meltdowns, real estate bubbles, collapse of China, oil prices at, I don't know, 14 cents a barrel. Is that how much it goes right now? <laughs> Honey, the kids aren't drinking milk anymore. It's too expensive. Feed them oil. <laughs> um, I can go through everything, turn me turn around. It is uh, nothing but bad news, bad news, bad news. What is going on in the world today? Uh, do, is, is the U.S. Uh, critically in danger of no longer being great? Uh, that's what I'm going to try to give you uh, a little bit of overview today. To start there, I'm going to start with a word. I love words. You know, economists are all about data, but I think words are more important than data because data without words is kind of meaningless, right? Uh, and every time I find a new word, especially one that is as relevant as this word is, I have to communicate that. So the word of the day, the word of this morning is uh, miserableism. Now, miserable, that's a real word. I picked this up, but I love this word. Miserableism is the philosophy of pessimism, or if you will, trying really hard to convince everybody things are really bad when in fact they are not. And boy, are we in a bout of miserableism right now. Now, there's nothing wrong with miserableism. There are people who make a good living with miserableism. Does anyone remember Morrissey? He was a miserableist, right? Huh? And of course, a little more, a little more current, a little more, uh, shall we say, modern generation. Uh, I remember Louis C.K., right? Of course, he's a miserableist. And let's not forget, of course, the stock market's a miserableist. They love miserableism because bad news generates volatility, and volatility generates trades, which generate commissions, which generate profits. And of course, it is 2016, which means, of course, running across our great nation is this group of miserableists all trying to tell us that the only person who has the cure to our ills, of course, is, is them, if they, we put them in the White House. Now, of course, we should point out that the vast majority of these folks have now disappeared, but we are down to a pack of about six miserableists at this particular point in time. <sighs> How true is it? How bad are things? Look, first of all, take a step back. Take a step back. Forget all the noise about recessions and what's going to come next and all these big issues and just look at the underlying facts. Look at what's actually happening out there. This is not bad. Things are fine, folks. Really, honestly, not great, but they're fine. That 2015 was a good year. I know we ended up on a little bit of a soft note, but when you look at 2015 in the whole, it turns out it was one of the better years we've had in quite a while. Labor markets continue to be nice and strong. There's no bubble. There's nothing close to a bubble right now. Housing still in recovery mode. Credit is starting to expand just a little bit, and that's good news for the economy. Commodity prices are down. I realize cheap oil isn't necessarily good for West Kern County, but overall for the U.S. economy, cheap oil is a good thing, not a bad thing. Simple as that. And guess what? California, remember we were written off? The next Greece, the next Detroit failing in a, in a, in a puddle of, of anti-business climate. Well, look, I realize California is a difficult place to work in, but on the other side of it, I also know something that California has been a success story for a long time, and guess right, right now, we are, again, a success story. In fact, right now, California is driving the nation forward. We are one of the strongest components of growth in the U.S. right now. Now, none of this means things are fine. I mean, I, I get it. There's all sorts of issues. We're still growing a little slower than we might want. Uh, state and local budgets are still stressed, too much money going to the wrong things. The global economy is wobbly, particularly China. We're dealing with bad financial regulations, local housing shortages, pensions, entitlements, inequality, political gridlock. I get all that. But here's the key. Here's the key. None of these things can cause a recession. None of these things are going to influence the path of the economy over the next year, the next couple of years. If you want to know what the base forecast is, 
And, you know, as a forecaster, I'm, I'm pretty good at understanding how forecasting works. Here's the reality of the situation. you got two years out of me. Okay? Two years. That's what we can really see, two years. And we have two years of growth in front of us. No doubt about it. The chance of a recession in the next two years is functionally zero. Not going to happen. But that doesn't mean the, the business, if you will, of business is done. And quite the opposite. We need to focus our attention on these midterm challenges. And that's what bothers me most about all the miserable, miserableism going on in our economy today. We are so busy, wrapped up in the nonsense of what is not or not happening in our economy right now, to pay attention to those true midterm challenges. So my goal today, in the context of the 40 minutes I have with you, is to try and give you some sense of A, why I'm so optimistic about the next couple of years, but then B, try to divert your attention a little bit towards the issues that do really challenge us, things we should be focusing our attention on. So let's just start with the big picture, GDP. Last year we grew at about 2.4%. Not you know, a little below average, we grow between three and three and a half percent on an average year overall. So a little less than normal, but still moving forward at a pretty good, good basis. Um, scratch away at the surface. That number actually doesn't give you a good read in the economy. I want to look at actually the demand coming, uh, growth in demand inside the U.S. economy. We call that final demand. That is a growth in spending by governments, businesses, and consumers. That actually grew about 2.9 percent last year. That's the best year since the Great Recession came to an end. It was a good year. The overall GDP number was a little lower, mainly because of two parts of the economy. One was trade. We did see a widening of the trade deficit last year, but not for the reasons you think. And two, two of course, was a pullback in non-residential construction. Uh, that, of course, was drilling new oil wells having to do with the cheap oil. But otherwise, every part of the U.S. economy is really ticking along. Take consumers, for example. Hmm. Uh, you might have heard at, towards the end of last year, the retail sales were weak, weak, weak. It was a terrible Christmas season. Retail sales growing 1% on a year-on-year -year basis. That number doesn't mean anything. It's a nominal number. It's not price adjusted. If you haven't been paying attention, this is an extremely low inflation world we live in right now. In fact, if you look at data coming from the Bureau of Economic Analysis on spending on goods in real terms, it turns out American spending on goods over the course of last year grew close to 4% on a year-on-year basis through the entire year. Americans are buying tons of junk. Tons of it. And by the way, that junk's pretty cheap. We're all happy. And keep hearing this term. Oh, where's the, where's the gasoline dividend? Where, where's the gasoline dividend? Gasoline's so cheap. Why aren't people spending it? They are. Look at auto sales. Auto sales through the roof last year. One of the best years ever for auto sales. The best year ever for American auto manufacturers. Never have American man auto manufacturers sold so many cars. The funny thing about oil, as we continue to have this sort of 1970s mentality that when the price of gas goes down, people have lots of money and they spend lots of things. And when it goes up again, you know, they can't spend anything. It's actually gasoline expenditures are a much smaller part of our budget than they were back then. And of course, today, we have options. We have ability to change our world, if you will, just a little bit. You want to know what the gasoline dividend is? Here's the gasoline dividend. The gasoline dividend is when you get to go out to your garage and look at that Prius and go, I always hated driving that car. That car sucks. I'm driving the Hummer today. <laughs> Woo! That's the gasoline dividend. And that's what people are doing. They're buying big cars again. They love it. Everything's happy on that particular front. There was a little bit of slowdown in service spending, but that's mainly utilities having to do with the warm winter. Uh, but otherwise, things are fine. Labor markets continue to be strong, adding about close to a quarter million jobs a month, 2.6 million jobs over the course of last year, about 2% growth overall. One sector got hit, mining. But 135,000 jobs. But mining isn't that big a part of the, of the U.S. labor market. It's not even a big part of the Kern County labor market, as the case may be. So a big negative there, but other parts of the economy moving forward very nicely, not the least of which is construction, which had 260,000 jobs, twice as much as what mining lost over the course of last year. So lots of good things happening there. Unemployment rates continue to fall. I love this. I always love this debate, the right unemployment rate, the wrong un unemployment rate. The bottom number there is the U3. That's the one that's 4.9%. It's the headline unemployment rate. And as soon as you bring up that number, there is always going to be somebody else going, well, that doesn't, that's not the right number. The right number is the one that includes workers who are um, discouraged or who are underemployed. And that would be the top number, the U6, as we call it. And I love this debate, which is right, which is wrong. Well, the answer, which is right, which is wrong, depends on who's in the White House. If there's a Democrat in the White House and you're a Republican, the top number's right, right? And if there's a Republican in the White House, a Democrat, you see what I'm saying? Look, neither one of these numbers is right or wrong. They're just two measure ways of measuring the, the, the same thing. And here's the key point. They're both falling. And by the way, the U6 and the U3 have both fallen to the point that right now that you're seeing enough compression labor market that real wages are starting to go up. This is good news. This is good news. 
What about the participation rate? Very weak right now. Well, it is true. The participation rate has fallen a lot. But guess what? That's not because of the Great Recession. It's not because of the weak U.S. economy. It's because the boomers. Now, look, I know the conversation today is about millennials. And millennials, of course, are an interesting generation. I hire a pack of millennials. I know this because they either quit or went by, by text messaging me. <laughs> I, as far as I know, they're not capable of looking me in the eye. And, and, and for the most part, if I don't compliment on them on their work every 15 minutes, I'm in big trouble. I'm a terrible boss. <laughs> but putting all that to one side, the big change in our economy today really isn't millennials. The millennial generation is big, but they're really only a little bit bigger than my, my poor generation. By the way, I'm a Gen Xer. And if I sound a little bitter, bitter about millennials, it's because as an Xer, by, gen, by definition, I'm bitter about everything. <laughs> but, but who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? We are, we are caught between the boomers and the millennials, which are two groups of the most spoiled people on the planet, as far as I can tell, <laughs> leaving us poor Xers in the middle having to pick up the mess. But anyway, Xers, go. Raise your hand if you're an Xer. Power, power, sisters and brothers. We will, we will persevere. Anyway, look, the biggest change in the population base today is not the, is the 16, 24-year-olds grew 4% over the last 10 years. 25 to 54 didn't grow at all. That population base fat. The biggest increase is the 55 plus range, grew 30%. That's all the millennials moving into those later years of the workforce. That's when participation rates naturally fall. Three fourths of this participation rate decline would have occurred even if we had never had a great recession. There's no doubt there are some people on the outside still looking in. But for the most part, the labor markets really have mostly healed at this point in time. And really, this is, again, this is a US economy that's strong, that's doing well. Um, how about consumer credit? That's been expanding very nicely right now, going about $20 billion per month. Overall, outstanding consumer debt has just gotten above $12 trillion again. One of the big questions is this is good news or bad news. After all, since you did see the big short, you all know that consumer borrowing got, got us into the big problems last time. Well, yes and no. Look, it is true that Americans hold a lot more debt down than they did 15 years ago or 20 years ago. But then again, remember, the cost of that debt is much cheaper now because of low interest rates. Indeed, if you look at the financial obligation ratio, the percent of household income used to support current financial obligations, it never really got that high last time. And right now, it's the lowest it's ever been. Never has been debt been less of a burden on American households than right now. The big issue to that last cycle had to do with the quality of debt. Subprime credit card loans, subprime auto loans. Of course, worst of all, the subprime mortgage loans. It was the quality of debt that blew up and created the massive financial chaos in our system, not the quantity of it. And by the way, right now, quality is still too good. The markets are too tight. If you look at, for example, the credit score by origination for mortgage loans right now, the median credit score is above 750. 20 years ago, it was 700. This is a problem. In fact, if I said, what's with consumer debt in our economy today, I would say it's still a problem because there are still a lot of people being locked out of the housing market, which is one of the reasons why the housing market recovery is slow. Now, this, is, of course, is the law of unintended consequences. This all stems from back in the day when Liz Warren got up there. And by the way, people always ask me my politics. I am a radical centrist, OK? That means when any, anybody running for president starts talking, I close my eyes and go, la, 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 I don't want to hear because it's a disaster. But again, you know, I, I just love these financial regulations we have, right? Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank. Well, Dodd-Frank is based on this idea. Banks bad, borrowers good. Banks evil, borrowers innocent victims. No, it doesn't work like that. Look, there was a breakdown in credit standards. Everybody on both sides of that transaction was to blame, and we have to prevent that from happening again. Fine, but you don't set up a system that functionally locks these people out of the credit market, which is exactly what Dodd-Frank has done. There were a group of Americans got absolutely hammered through this last downturn. They should have had the opportunity to get back in the housing market at this time of historic affordability, and instead they have been locked out. And that is a big problem for our economy. We need to revisit that equation because there are ways of having this conversation that doesn't boil down to bad and good. There's a, there's a much more nuanced central version to that particular conversation. Indeed, if you look across different types of consumer debt, right now every type of consumer debt is seeing lower and lower delinquency rates with one kind, with one exception, student loans. Student loan delinquencies are up. Ah, the student loan crisis. The student loan crisis. You probably heard this on the election trail. The horrible burden, the horrible burden our millennials are carrying today because of the extensive student loan debt that these poor kids are carrying with them. 
I have never in my life heard such a pile of garbage as the student loan crisis, okay? First of all, right off the bat, who knows this number? What is the average student graduating from college today have in the way of student debt? What's the average student have? Anyone? 37, I heard. Someone else? 60, I heard. How much? 35. No, you're all wrong. It's $24,000. You might have heard the 35, but here's a little star asterisk after that. It says, the average 35,000 for the students that graduate with debt, because a lot don't. And once you add that into account, it's about $24,000. Folks, that is not a life-altering event. $24,000 of debt is a mid-range Kia, OK? <laughs> Can we be, please be rational about this conversation? And by the way, take a step back. Where is the largest amount of, where's the biggest problem with delinquencies with student loans? For the student with 150K or the student with 5K? Turns out it's 5K, not 150K. And of course, the person with 150K probably has a medical degree and they're probably starting at 185,000 a year with Kaiser. The person with five was probably some poor person who got suckered into one of these fly by night for profit colleges. That's not a student loan crisis, that's fraud. The debt should be forgiven, the person who made that loan should go to jail and we should close the school down. But putting that to one side, there is no student loan crisis. Well, is college degree still worth it today? I see that on the internet all the time. Maybe I should stop looking at the internet. This could be part of my problem. <laughs> of course the college degree is worth it. Look, the net present value of getting a bachelor degree today is $300,000. That's net of taxes paid. That's net of college, college tuition paid, all the above. $300,000, that is still the best investment you will make. And what's most amazing about that number is it's that high despite the terrible educational choices our children are making. <laughs> and that's the big key thing. You know, look, look, back when I went to school all those years ago, to some extent, you get a degree, you'll be fine. Because back then it was still, you know, something new. It was a kind of a thing you held up. Today, everybody goes to college. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. And as a result, that just having a piece of paper is no longer, if you will, the, the ticket to a good, you have to look at a college education like an investment, like any other investment. And unfortunately, we don't have that conversation with our kids. We have some great data now, the American Community Survey. We can actually go through the, the data and figure out what kind of degrees people are getting. And this is degrees people are getting ranked by income. And this is for 21 to 27 year olds. And it turns out the highest value degrees from a wage perspective for full-time workers is engineering, 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 computer science, engineering, 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 mathematics. You working with me here? <laughs> In other words, it's all the degrees that don't allow you to necessarily party every single Saturday, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, and sometimes Tuesday night, okay? <laughs> well, that's nice, I, I get that. These are harder degrees. Because they're worth so much, clearly many people are getting these degrees, right? No, not at all. In fact, the number one degree awarded in the US over the last five years is psychology. <laughs> 300,000 degrees in psychology awarded in the last five years in the US, 60,000 per year. Folks, Americans are messed up, but really? <laughs> 60,000 psychologists per year? I don't think so. This is the conversation, not that there's a student loan crisis, but look, look, I'm not saying don't chase your dreams, but if you want to chase your dreams, may I suggest starting in a community college and then going to a state school. If on the other hand, you're going to Stanford, you're going to get an engineering degree so you can afford it. That's not a difficult conversation. That's called a rational conversation. That's the kind of conversation we need to have. All right, I'm behind. How about housing? Housing is doing fine, not great, but fine. Five and a half million sales. Home prices continue to grow at about 5% on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, look at the big change in growth, mainly the West Coast and the South at this particular point in time. Have homes gone to, up too high in terms of prices? Not at all. If you look at housing affordability controlling for 4% mortgage rates, turns out houses, houses are still affordable to a record degree. Yes, affordability has declined, but only from record high levels of affordability. This is a market that still has a lot of legs in front of it. If you, look, if you look at housing starts, uh, housing starts still weak. We should be running about 1.2 million new single family housing starts. We're still 100,000. Again, this goes back to the issues with mortgage origination. When you lock a huge part of the population out of buying a home, it turns out they don't buy homes. We don't build a lot of them. Now, things are changing. It's become a little easier to borrow out there. And that will start to help 
our move our economy forward over the course of the next couple of years. This is a, a positive thing. Yes, it's frustrating the housing market has recovered as much, but because of been such a slow recovery, think of the legs it's going to have on a tortoise versus here kind of argument. And of course, there's better news. On the left side, this is one of my favorite graphs out here. On the left hand side is change in households. And this tells such a perfect story for what's been happening in our economy. You can see the huge surge in the middle part of the last decade. That's when your 23 year old announced they had just gotten their first subprime loan and were buying their first house and were going to become the next internet, I'm sorry, next real estate millionaire. Okay, two years later when that housing, household formation number collapses, that's when your now 25 year old has moved back into your basement because they got foreclosed on. Are <laughs> you working with me here? Just now, household formations are picking up. People are starting to move out again. And as a result of that, more demand for homes, less vacancies. It's going to be a good year for housing. That's important for the U.S. economy. It's going to keep us moving along. How about industrial production? You've probably heard a lot of bad things about manufacturing. Turns out manufacturing's not doing bad. Oh, it hasn't been growing very rapidly, but it is still growing. Manufacturing output is up, not down. I don't care what the ISM index says. That is its survey. It is not an actual number the way the production numbers are. Well, how can that be? How can it be up? Well, you got to remember, there are parts of the industrial production are doing bad, and there are parts that are doing great. Great is motor vehicles, uh, electric uh, machinery, non-metallic minerals, petroleum refining, furniture. All these are up. What's down is two sectors, mining and non-metallic minerals. That, of course, has to do with the commodity bus going down. In particular, the big crunch has been with mining of new wells. What's going on out there? Why is oil so cheap? Well, look, this is not a demand phenomenon. I can't believe it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, this sort of throwaway line in the news. Oil is so cheap because of China. Really? China? First of all, folks, like, like I know China's slow, but they haven't stopped growing. They're still growing. By the way, for anybody who's wondering, in 2015, the Chinese imported 9% more oil than they did in 2014. Cheap oil is not a Chinese phenomenon, period. This is not a demand issue. Oil is cheap, not because of demand. Oil is cheap because of supply. What kind of a supply? American supply. Look, five, six years ago, U.S. production exploded. And we went from a little over 5 million barrels a day to almost 10 million barrels a day. Why? Because of fracking. To put this in context, right now the U.S. is producing more oil than any other country in the world. We're producing 15% more oil annually than Saudi Arabia is. People keep saying, why isn't Saudi Arabia trying to drive prices up? Because they're no longer the swing producer. We are. And by the way, we've had cheap oil for over a year. Why hasn't, why hasn't production fallen? Because they got so far ahead of themselves in terms of fracking that there were over 2,000 drilled wells, drilled unfracked wells when oil prices started to fall. And every time oil prices go up just a little bit, they uncap a well, crack it, pull the oil out. And this, hasn't, this isn't going to slow down at all. Look, fracking is a brand new technology. We have years and years of supply of oil sitting in the round in shale oil reserves. And we're not the only ones. The Russians have huge oil reserves. Brazil, Argentina, China, everybody has these huge shale oil reserves. This is a brave new world. It's a brave new world. And that means oil is going to be cheap for a while. Now I realize that's tough on Kern County. By the way, you inventing fracking. This is your fault. <laughs> The Russians and the Saudi Arabians will be following a lawsuit against you any time now. Be prepared. But, you know, it's a brave new world. Simple as that. And by the way, on net, yes, this is good for the U.S. economy, period. It's good for consumers. It's good for the farmers. It's good for the logistics companies. It's fine. Yes, there's some shakeout, but it's not going to sink the U.S. economy. Not even close. Look, we've seen this play out before. In the mid-80s, in the late 90s, two periods of time, we see big pullbacks in mining in the U.S. economy, and it didn't influence anything. Nothing else happened because it's relatively constrained. And this time, it's even better. Because right now, while we are getting hit in terms of, uh, in terms of overall decline in mining activity, we're still producing lots. And that's driving other parts of the economy, as the case may be. Indeed, here's some numbers. This is employment indexes for various sorts of parts of the United States. North Dakota's way down. You can see they peaked, and they've come down pretty sharp. I mean, that's that big decline there, it's got to be at least 114 jobs. At least 114 jobs in North Dakota, right? <laughs> but then you go to the next number down, that's Houston. Center, of course, the, the, the shale in, in southeast Texas. And you can see that haven't even stopped growing. I mean, they've slowed down, but they, they haven't shrunk. It's not 1985 where they had one of the worst regional recessions ever. Dallas hasn't slowed at all. 
People are wondering, will oil sink the U.S. economy? It hasn't even sunk the Dallas economy. So yes, we're in a transition. There's some companies that are struggling, but for the most part, it's not a big enough challenge to threaten the U.S. recovery, as the case may be. The other part of it is trade. Again, well, the dollar's high, China's not doing too well, that's why U.S. Can't, can't export products. Again, completely not true. The real exports, once you price adjust, real exports have been nice and steady for the last year and a half. They haven't fallen. They haven't been growing, but they haven't fallen. U.S. manufacturers, because of efficiency gains, because of competitiveness, continue to thrive in the global economy, despite the fact that the dollar is up 15% and the global economy is wobbly. The reason the trade deficit is widening is because of imports. It's because Americans have lots of money, and they're spending it, and they're spending it on stuff made in China. That's what's driving the trade numbers. So we're okay, a little bit of a stall, but there's nothing here that worries me. Nothing is going to slow down our expansion, as the case may be. And what about the bubble? What about the financial bubble? There's no bubble, not even close to a bubble. Yes, I, I know, I, I've heard all the worries about tech and worries about unicorns and worries about the stock market and worries about sub Let's take it, forget it. <clears throat> Look, two, two, four reasons why there's no bubble, nothing you have to worry about. Asset prices have gone up a lot, but asset prices have gone up because of low interest rates. Go, go back to your finance class. You know, one thing you remember from finance class, your, your finance professor would say, okay, you have an asset and it gives you $100 every period forever. Interest rate's 5%, what's that asset worth? And you go, oh, I remember this formula. You take your 100, you put it under 0.05, $2,000. Ding, ding, right answer. What if the interest rate falls to 3%? Well, now it's one, one, 100 over 0.03. That means, of course, it goes up to $3,000, or 3300 something like that. Anyway, you get the right idea, right? <laughs> That's the key here. We're seeing asset prices go up because we are in a low interest rate regime. Ah, but interest rates are going to go up any day now, right? No. Look, interest rates have been falling for 25 years. They've been falling because inflation has gone away and because we live in a world that is awash with capital. This is a world, back before the Great Recession ever became a thing, Ben Bernanke, when he first got in office as the new head of the Federal Reserve, talked, his first speech was about what he called the global savings glut. The fact that we have far more supply of capital, boomers trying to catch up for retirement, pension funds trying to catch up, China, China whose economy is almost as large as the United States, who has a savings rate two and a half times our savings rate, pouring capital into global markets. Lots of supply, not as much demand, that's a low interest rate regime. That's exactly where we are. So these asset prices make sense in that metric. Now, by the way, there's another reason to, to think about it as well. Here's the key. Every time the stock market goes through one of these conniptions, I want you to remember this. Asset markets don't create recessions. Oh, Wall Street will tell you they do. You hear it all the time. Oh, worry about wealth effects. The financial markets are worried about this, worried about that. The famous old joke, Paul Samus had said this was, the stock market has predicted nine of the last five downturns, okay? That's because every once in a while, the market periodically freaks out. But unless the real economy is out of whack, unless there's real imbalances, for example, 2006, households weren't saving. 2006, we are building 2 million homes for a nation adding <coughs> 1 million households. All sorts of big problems you could see out there. Where are the problems today? If there's not problems in the real economy, it doesn't matter what the financial markets do. Always keep that in mind. So where are we on that particular front? We'll take the stock market. Yes, stock market was near an all-time high. Guess what? So are corporate profits. <clears throat> They've grown, grown faster than any other part of the economy. If you look at a forward-looking P.E. ratio, looks like asset prices look just fine. Indeed, if you do an equity earnings spread, take that P.E. ratio, flip it over E.P. minus a 10-year treasury, even before the sell-off, stocks look like a still good buy. And of course, uh, Business America, <clears throat> their financials look good. Not only is profits, but their debt and equity ratios are nice and tight right now. No problems here. And of course, as for the market itself, you can't possibly understand what this says, but let me explain it to you. <laughs> Typically, we have one market sell-off in a recession and then one non-market sell-off in a non-recession period. When I say market sell-off, I'm talking about like a, a double-digit decline in the market. Since the Great Recession came to an end, we've had four double-digit meltdowns in the stock market, and all four have gone away with nothing happening. Look, the stock market isn't telling you what the economy is doing. The stock market is behaving like a room full of first graders drinking espresso and playing full contact musical chairs. <laughs> There's a lot of noise, a lot of action, and not a lot of logic. 
So your best bet is to ignore it. Forget the market. It's irrelevant. Just forget it. Okay? And as for interest rates, they're going to stay low for the while. For you, and I just told you, the global savings club. How about California? Again, a few years ago, this is a quote. I had to respond to this. I was in San Diego for a bomb buyers conference. And this was the question they put in giant, you know, 117 font on the screen in front of me. Looking back a few years, 2009-10, everyone was saying California's going to fail like Greece. Detroit, things look different now. What has happened to turn things around? Well, the first thing I said was, not everyone said that. <laughs> That's a preposterous thing to say. It's a stupid thing to say. Look, I get it. Are we a business-friendly state? No. No, we are not a business-friendly state. I get that. But guess what? It doesn't matter that much. See, that's the dirty little secret. All oh, everybody's constantly talking about Texas. Oh, they're so business-friendly. Kansas is very business-friendly right now. Their economy is imploding. By the way, California, their business and friendliness is not a new phenomenon. I've been here 25 years. It's never been a business-friendly place from what I remember. And it hasn't mattered. California continues to be a success story. Now, it isn't to say we shouldn't be in Sacramento fighting like the Dickens to make this place a little more business friendly, but not because it's for growth. It's for us. It's to help us keep our sanity. That's why you need to be up there and fight that fight. But don't think that this is a growth issue, because it really isn't. Not the way that people try to sell it to you. <clears throat> and look at the numbers. In 2014, California, one of the fastest growing states in terms of output, Texas as well. How much of Texas is oil? How much of Texas is Rick Perry's genius? Well, let's fast forward to 2015, and now Texas is not growing at all from an output perspective. Sorry, Rick. California, of course, still moving along just fine. Over the last 20 years, we've 30% growth in our payroll compared to 20% overall. <clears throat> We're in the top six or seven for growth in the nation right now. All good numbers, as the case may be. What kind of jobs? What kind of output? Uh, construction, top of the list, logistics, information, healthcare, hospitality, education, professional, everything growing, good solid numbers. The only thing doing weak in the, in the state in the economy right now is a total farm only up 0.3%. I'll come back to that in just a second. Services up by 1.4%. Financial activities up 1.5%. Government up 1.6%. But a lot of important sectors doing very well. As for output growth from the third quarter 14, third quarter 15, most read numbers there, we're kind of showing it up. Our economy grew 3.5% over those four quarters compared to, that's about 1.4% higher than the state and nation overall. And I go through the list of rapidly growing parts of our economy, hospitality, management, wholesale trade, construction, professional, and top of the list, one of the most rapidly growing parts of our economy right now is agriculture. Through the roof, from an output perspective, as well as from a revenue perspective. Now this may be a bit of a shock. You probably have heard about our drought. What is going on in agriculture? Well, look, I realize this is an ag community, and I realize this is a sensitive subject, but folks, we, we need to talk just a little, okay? <laughs> Last year, when Jerry Brown said, hey, you urban areas got to suck it up, I was a little surprised, because his, his point of saying, well, all the urban areas have to have a 25% cutback, but the ag areas don't, it's because the ag areas have been suffering. They haven't. Ag employment's at an all-time high. Ag income's at an all-time high. In 2014, the most recent complete data, revenues, middle of a, of a, of a, of a recession, ag had grown the revenues by 5% over the previous year. Ag's doing great. Ag's doing great. So let's stop pretending for a second that they're not. They are. They're doing fine. And I don't begrudge anybody in the ag community doing well. I'm, I'm happy the numbers are up. I'm happy things are looking good. Here's my problem. My problem is how the ag community is making money. Specifically, let me, let me kind of go into this. The most recent crop reports suggest that in 2014, we had about 1.3 million acres of hay growing in the state of California. Hay, an incredibly water-intensive, low-value crop. We're talking a crop that per acre uses about five and a half acre feet per year. In other words, all the hay grown in the state of California in 2014 adds up to about 65 to 70 percent of all urban consumption. Now again, hay is cheap. It's 200 bucks an acre foot. That's what you get for it. That up to be clear, that means all the ag production in the state, all the ag production in the state is about 2% of ag revenues. This is a low value water intensive crop. If we just halved the production of hay in our state, we would have plenty of water for all the other needs, for all the other farmers, for all the nut guys out there, and for the urban areas. We could refill our reservoirs. And 
ag revenues would have still gone up because that tiny little share of ag revenues is less than the growth in revenues from 2013 to 2014. We got to be serious about this. And by the way, I'm not telling the ag guys, I want to take your, your water away. Not at all. <clears throat> I want to pay you for your water. Because guess what? A hay guy, he's making 50 bucks an acre foot he's using. San Diego, they're willing to pay $2,000 to desalinate. I see a transaction here, folks. <laughs> How about you pay them $100 for that water? Oh, I got an idea. There's so much value left over, <clears throat> we'll put $100 in to restore that land for environmental or recreational use. And I'll throw another 100 in to develop a fund for economic development in those ag communities. The only people who suffer from this particular transaction are Chinese cows and pigs. Because that's where a quarter of that hay is going. It's been put on boats and shipped to China. This is so obvious. This is so good for every part of California to have this conversation. Why don't we? Why isn't it happening? Why can't San Diego pay that hay guy in Imperial County for that water? Because we have 1,300 water districts. That's why. The water districts control the water, but they don't profit if they sell it. Their job is to take the water and give it to the people they've always given it to. To take usage and separate it from ownership is insane. That's not how you manage a scarce resource. So let's, let's take a deep breath, take a step back from the ledge here and recognize a little bit of logic applied to the allocation of one of the scarcest resources our state has can do a whole world of good for everybody in this state. Everybody. But well, we gotta start with that point. How about another issue that bothers me? Hey, incomes are up in the straight state, growing faster in the U.S. That makes me happy. Taxable sales growth growing faster here than retail spending in the nationwide. All good news. Ah, uh, but again, people in Sacramento, they're all very happy about the fact that we have lots of money coming in the coffers right now. Ah, but the problem, we're getting all that money because of the capital markets. See, because of Prop 13, we've had to dip deeper and deeper in the personal income tax. Prop 30 made it even more so. We have them the highest marginal tax rates in the nation. No, I, I, look, honestly, I'm not fussed about that. You want to soak the rich? Fine, fine, do, go ahead, I don't care. I know better to know that income taxes are that big of a diminishment of effort. But remember that room full of first graders drinking espresso? That is now our state budget. We have internalized the chaos in the stock markets in our budget system. We've seen this play out before. We saw it in 2000, we saw it in 2006. Massive budget deficits appear overnight when the capital markets tank. Th that's not a way to run a state. We gotta get off this train. We gotta rebuild our revenue system. Because guess what? Whatever's there now will disappear like that the next time there's a market meltdown. But no one's talking about it. They just wanna extend Prop 30. Haven't we learned anything? Come on. We can have a real conversation about this. Not hard. How about local growth? What's happening here? Well, Kern, near the bottom of the list, 1.2%, one of the slowest growing ones. Now, you know, a few months ago, it was actually down. It's starting to come back just a little bit. This is obviously oil. No doubt about it. But here's the key. As bad as the oil situation is, as much as the slowdown has occurred, the county is still growing. There's still good numbers out there. And you look at the numbers going on right now. What's growing? Retail trade, education's up, government's up, hospitality's up, logistics is up. All good, solid growth numbers here. The only part of the economy that's down, obviously construction wrapped around oil. Mining, of course, is down 21%, lost 2,700 jobs there. Manufacturing down just a little bit as well. There's no doubt the county is taking a bit of a hit right now. But again, take a step back. Let's get a little perspective on this. Let's look about things in the long run. Look, current has been one of the fastest growing economies. There was barely a recession here compared to the rest of the U.S., um, compared to the rest of the state. Right now, compared to 2000, this area has 35% more jobs compared to 15% overall for the state. These are good numbers. Unemployment's continuing to fall here as well. Yes, it's a bump in the road, but that's just it. It's a bump in the road. The place, just like Dallas is working its way through, just like Houston is working its way through, so is Kern County. So don't let what's happening in oil think that it means Kern's going to slow down or even stop growing. Not at all. The fundamentals, what's going on here, are fairly important. And you know, that's true for most of the South San Juan King Valley. We did a study not too long ago for the area here. And I hear some of the rhetoric, unemployment rates are high, the area is in a depression. Read a book before you start making pronouncements like that. The South Central Valley does have a high unemployment rate. Why? Because of ag. When you have ag, you have to have low-skilled workers to deal with that. And low-skilled workers, by definition, have a very high unemployment rate. That's just the nature of the beast. As long as you have ag, your unemployment rate's going to be higher 
than the rest of the United States. Simple as that. And that's okay. The key is the, the trends for, for employment. And look at the unemployment. Look at it here. You know, in the middle of it, it was about 16%. Right now, it's down to about 10%. So things are fine. And if you look at the Central Valley, all the big growth that's been going on here, and you say, well, what does it mean? For the four counties, Fresno, Kern, Kings, Tulare, you're talking two and a half million people. That's more people than New Mexico. Aggregate output here is about $68 billion. That's more than Hawaii or West Virginia. This is a big, rapidly growing economy you're sitting in the middle of. This is an exciting place. Yes, there's a bump on the road. Forget the bump. It'll be behind you, and there's lots of other things going on here. Take, for example, economic output. Again, growing much more rapidly here than the rest of the state, or as the rest of the United States overall. Mining is a big part of that. 25% of the increase, one-fourth of the increase in output over the last uh, 15 years or so is wrapped around oil production. But finance is up there, ag is up there, wholesale is up there, professional is up there, healthcare is up there, manufacturing is up there. In other words, there's plenty of other sectors that are going to continue to thrive. And once you move through the oil slowdown, all these other sectors are going to start growing. Just a function of paying attention to the fact that there's lots of other things happening in the local economy. And you certainly see that in taxable sales as well. It is true, of course, that some places like Taft or Arvin are down. But on the other hand, Baker, uh, uh, Bridgecrest and Wasco and Delano are all heading up in terms of sales. There are people are buying stuff. And last but not least, I want to talk about housing, state housing. You know, we have been so proud, if you will, the fact that our state's growing so rapidly, almost 3% on a year-on-year -year basis in terms of job growth. Labor force is only growing at 1%. That only works when you have slack in the labor force, a high unemployment rate. But now, unemployment in the state continues to fall, fall, fall. We're getting to the point where suddenly there's very little in the way of slack left in the labor market. If we want the state to continue to grow rapidly, it means having a workforce to do that. Unfortunately, we're not building housing for it. Housing right now is becoming very, very expensive, and this is primarily a supply phenomenon. Look, single family has barely come back. Multifamily has come back, but single family barely has. Overall, new population permits in the state, about four to one. We're already underbuilding in the midst of what we already have in terms of, of a housing shortage. Now, locally, prices are going up as well. You can see a little better numbers in terms of permit. About 2,100 new permits in 2015 compared to the previous year. Some recovery, but still relatively slow. Now, there's no bubble. Again, this is not a function of prices getting too far or too hard of themselves. In fact, if you account for interest rates, it turns out housing is still affordable in California in our own shockingly unaffordable sort of way. We have one of the worst overcrowding styles, you can see, one of the lowest vacancy rates out there today. Why don't we build enough housing? Very simple, CEQA Prop 13. CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, as we know, the regulation that, while well-intentioned, has been used and abused by every special interest and NIMBY to fight against anything, anywhere, anytime, all the time, no matter what. I don't care what it is. And, of course, Prop 13, our beloved property tax system, which not only forces us to be more and more reliant on, on the, that hyperactive personal income tax revenue stream, but also which diminishes the incentive for local cities to invest in housing. Look, sit down with a finance person in a city. You got 20 acres of land, what do you want to do with it? Go through the list. I want retail. Lots of tax revenues, doesn't cost me anything. If I can't have that, I want other kinds of commercial. If I can't have that, I'll, I'll suffer with single family. Last but not least, what I do not want is multifamily residential. It's very low tax base, costs me tons in terms of services used from roads to, to police, to ambulance, to schools. That's a loser. I don't want it. You got, if you want cities to build housing, if you want cities to fight against the NIMBYs using CEQA, you have to incentivize them to want that kind of housing. You can't just waggle a finger and say you should do it because you should do it. Any policy that relies on better nature of human beings to succeed is going to fail. And you know, I like to say this more than anything else. You, if you don't believe me about housing, take a look at this. This is net migration in and out of the, you, California. You will hear this story all the time. People flee California because of high taxes. Actually, no. High-income people are more likely to move into California than leave. It's low-income folks who leave the state, and that, of course, is because of, of high housing costs. That is the primary driver of people leaving the state, not taxes, not taxes. And indeed, that actually is good for Kern County at some level. Because when you have the reluctance to build enough housing in the core part of Southern California, and like it or not, you're part of Southern California, that pushes growth to the periphery. Look, if you look at what's gonna happen in this state over the next 20 years, this is a projection straight from the Department of Finance. 
Los Angeles is going to add 976,000 people in the next 20 years. That's 9% growth rate. Kern County is projected to add 400,000, almost half as much as L.A. That's a 44% growth rate. Why are they coming here? Because of housing, because you could build, because you could do things here. So forget about oil. There's a lot coming down the pike. This here area has huge growth potential because California has growth potential, and you're part of that growth margin, as the case may be. So I got some forecasts here. I'll let you chew on that. We'll have these slides available for you so you can, you can, you can look at them later. But we're looking for a return to normalcy. Job growth is going to come back. We think that you'll work through the worst of the mining situation at a particular point in time. Overall, looking a little longer term down the thing, huge potential for Kern County, huge potential for the city of Bakersfield. So the key here is to make sure that we focus on policy issues that make sure that occurs. Investment in infrastructure, investment in education, investment in housing. It's there. So I'll wrap up very quickly with this. What do you worry about, what you don't worry about? Don't worry about the dollar, worry about China, don't worry about student debt, worry about educational choices, don't worry about asset bubbles, don't worry about bad financial regulation, don't worry about drought, worry about water policy. Don't worry about labor markets, worry about growing wealth inequality, don't worry about business, worry about California housing. Don't worry about California tax levels. Worry about California tax structure. Don't worry about politics. You know, that's, that's the last thing. And I'll say this. I'm going to go back to my first message, what I said. Look, I'm watching this presidential debates, and it makes me crazy. I listen to the, what, what talked about in terms of what's important and what's not, and I see I'm missing the point. But the key here, of course, is about political engagement. There are relatively simple solutions to the problems that bedevil us. You don't need a PhD in economics to understand these things, these solutions. What you do need a PhD in is psychology to understand why somehow or other our, psych, our, our political leaders have completely divorced themselves from the reality of the ground level situation. But part of that's being involved, part of that's having conversation, part of that is standing up here the way I'm in front of you and talking about the real issues and to understand that there is a middle ground, there is a way of dealing with these things that's good for everyone. Thank you very much everybody, have a good couple of years.